Fun fact that I think we just cracked, because mm -hmm. we're detectives and journalists, automotive journalists. <laughs> uh, Smoky Unix livery is cool AF, mm -hmm. and also, we believe, the inspiration for Ricky Bobby's dad's muscle car. I'll pull up Ricky Bobby's dad's. <laughs> it's like a... Go ahead and Google it, <clears throat> unless you're driving. Bobby's dad. But it's car. got it's like really cool gold on top. Oh yeah, and oh it's a Chevelle too. Yeah, dude. This is definitely Ricky Bobby's dad's car. Yeah. This is the car that Ricky found. What? Is it the same year? Is it the same number? Uh, it's the same number but different year. But still, that's really cool. Has a number thirteen on the side. Yep. That's cool. You learn something new every day, and you Dang. guys are about to learn a bunch of new stuff today, because guess what? It's the Past Gas Podcast. Roll that theme song. Yeah. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars. It's not about ports. I am one of your hosts, James Pumphrey, and as always, I'm joined by my best buddy, my protege, my son. Hello. Nolan J. Sykes. The J stands for... Jacked. Ooh. You're looking buff. Did you get a new t-shirt? I got a new t-shirt from Target. Nice. Uh, nice. It's $6, so it'll probably <laughs> last three washes, and mm -hmm. then I'll have to throw it away. It's or donate it. won't throw it away. No, I mean, turn it into rags. Yeah. for my Because I'm just in the garage. Just in the garage. Got to wipe all that. Got to wipe my hand. You're not, a real guy. you're not a real car guy unless yeah. you're wiping your hands on your shirt. Yeah. You can't wear gloves. You can't frick gloves. You're not a real car guy unless you take a shower with Orange Fast. Yeah, you're not a real car guy unless you hate everything but your car. <laughs> you're not a real car guy unless you're mean to young kids. <laughs> yeah, at car shows. This is part two of the Smoky, the story of Smokey Eunuch, the greatest cheater in NASCAR. Um, Last week we learned that not only was he a great cheater in NASCAR, but he lived a pretty insane life. Yeah, very interesting guy. Fought in World War II. Shaved his pubes in the 40s, grew out a big old beard. <laughs> yep. Uh, 80 of the first 100 pages of his autobiography are just about doing it. Yep. He, very just interesting, interesting guy. And as we'll learn um, today, I mean, he... I'm going to blow your mind, James. Yeah? Yeah. Would you say that this <laughs> uh, episode is child safe or oh, safe for um, work? Because last week's episode definitely was not safe for work. I don't think this is an, a child safe one. Yeah. Uh, we'll so go through it again. If you're driving your kids to school right now, yeah. go ahead and pause it. Go put ahead a, and turn put, on Radio Lab. Something. Yeah, put on know. some Baby Shark. <laughs> drop them off. Then you can listen to this on your way to work. Yeah. All right. So when we last left off with the tale of Smokey Eunuch, he had just opened his shop, Smokey's Garage, the best damn garage in town in Daytona, Florida. And things were going pretty smoothly for a while, at least. As the business grew, James, uh, Smokey mm -hmm. began to take in some new members, including an alligator what? that he had found in his home underneath so cool. the front service counter that he affectionately <laughs> named Albert. Uh, they would hey, what the hell is that? Ah, <laughs> oh, you know what? You're kind of cute. <laughs> they would feed Albert scraps, and the gator would nibble at the heels of people he didn't like. How does... Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Soon. Gators um, don't nibble. No, I know. Gators snap. Yeah. Well, maybe this is... I mean, his name's Albert. He's probably cute. He's probably got, like, really doughy eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really want an alligator, actually. Like, I saw a video on Instagram of a bunch of baby crocodiles. Uh huh. And if they stayed that size, oh, be I would awesome. love one. Yeah, it'd be sick. But the problem with baby alligators is that they become grown up alligators. Yeah, and and you got flush. I heard. <laughs> I think it. Might, I think it might be an urban myth, but I heard like in New York and you know the 30s or 40s or something, like uh, people would go to vacation in Florida and mm -hmm. they would buy their kids like these little alligators, and then uh, then they would grow, and then people would flush them down the toilet. And then there's a bunch of alligators in the sewers of New York. I do think that's an urban myth, but I think it is also plausible with no evidence to back it up. But I, it sounds <laughs> we, like well, we gotta yeah. we gotta get down there and find them gators. Yeah. So, like I said, uh, Albert would nibble at people's heels. Uh, one day, and a lawyer came by and uh, threatened to sue over the mistreatment of Albert. Mm -hmm. um, so Smokey grabbed Albert by the tail. Dragged him out through the front door back in the swamp and um, 
avoided the lawsuit. Avoided the lawsuit. There wouldn't be a lawsuit for Smokey Eunuch. I'm sorry, Albert. <laughs> Lawman says you gots to go. <laughs> you can nip at the heels of my guests, but you can't mess with my pocketbook. <laughs> Back into the swamp where you came from. Um, at this time, though, Smokey's wife forbade Smokey from doing any racing whatsoever, which kind of defeated the point of him going to Daytona because that's where all the racing was going on. He wanted to race. Yeah, but he did the second best thing. He built the race cars instead. Uh, Smokey would, uh, could be seen. Smokey could be seen in the pits wearing his signature all-white uh, overalls. That's ballsy. Yeah. That's bold. Uh, accessorized with a corncob pipe. So he dressed like Popeye. And a cowboy hat. He dressed exactly like Popeye. Po- <laughs> cowboy Popeye. <laughs> cowboy yeah. Popeye. Yeah, that is kind of a baller move, having all-white. Oh, hell yeah. And, I mean, he was a guy that would get his hands dirty, so he probably went through a lot of those suits. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1951, Smokey was contacted to help a failing company with their race efforts. This company was Hudson Motor Cars. Uh, Hudson had just released the Hudson Hornet, and it was actually a pretty great car. Uh, it was by far the fastest, cheapest, and most efficient car on the road at the time. But the only issue was it sucked at the racetrack. Uh, so nobody bought them because they just saw them getting their ass whooped mm-hmm. at the Oval. And they're like, nope, not I'm a good not car. I'm not going to buy a loser car. Nope, you're not going to do that. If I get a car, I'm going to get a winner. Yeah. Not not even the first winner, not a second winner. No, not second, first loser. Yeah. Uh, Hudson hoped investing in racing would boost the sales, so they turned to Smokey Eunuch for help. Uh, the Hudson Hornet, I think, is the old car from Cars. Yeah, it's the car from Cars. Yes, yeah, the, the car guy, from cars. the uh, turn right to go left guy, the drifter guy. Smokey determined that the Hornet's biggest issue was the intake. While the engine was technically the best engine in stock car racing at the time, the single barrel carb on top was. Trash. Mm -hmm. And it choked all the power, baby. Mm -hmm. NASCAR rules didn't allow any modification to the cars outside of what could be purchased directly off the dealer lot. So Smokey hatched a plan. As we'll find out, Smokey tended to do. (laughs) Uh, He convinced Hudson to release a performance package of the Hudson Hornet, the Twin H package. Uh, father of Triple H, the wrestler. <laughs> it boasted a dual carb setup, a dual exhaust kit, mm. and bored the inline six engine out to 308 cubic inches. This performance package flew off the lots. That's a big six. Yeah, I'm uh, just on Google looking that up. That's a that's a five liter inline six. Yeah. Well, back in the day, I feel like there were a lot of cars where if you do the math in your head, you're like, that piston must have been the size of a yeah. coffee can. Yeah. <laughs> It was like, That's a big it's, inline. Yeah, it's six. like eight liter four cylinders and stuff like yeah, in the thirties. Totally. And just for reference, like today, like the Mustang has the a five liter V eight, mm-hmm. the Coyote, and that's I mean, that thing's pushing like four hundred and fifty horsepower, something like that. But um a f- yeah, five liter inline is very, very impressive. This performance package flew off the lots. And the engine remained the engine of choice in NASCAR up until the creation of the Chevy small block V8. Mm. The twin H package was the first factory cheater kit, quotes, ever used in NASCAR. And it certainly would not be the last. Mm. There's been a million yeah. since. But this was just the beginning of Smokey's legacy of cheating because technically it's not even cheating. It's just being no. creative. Yeah. In the early 50s, it was widely accepted that every team would bend the rules. And I think that's still pretty, pretty much, much true today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, And it was pretty much okay as long as he didn't get caught, which is pretty much true today. But Smokey was still new at this, so Smokey got caught. Uh. Smokey's cars had been winning a ton of races, but one day during tech inspection, it was discovered that he had modified the headers of the Hornet's engine just to increase the horsepower just a teeny little smidge, just a little baby Mm -hmm. bit, just a little smidgems. Immediately, NASCAR director Bill France hopped on Smokey's ass, which he probably liked, and demanded Smokey find a new engine and start from scratch. Hey, get off my ass. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you get off my ass, Bill France. (laughs) Unfortunately, the Hudson team was short on funds and only came with one engine. Mm -hmm. So Smokey was forced to improvise. He zip zap zopped and pulled the engine <laughs> from the team's tow truck and started to rebuild it on the in the shade of an oak tree, getting it ready for the race. That's crazy. Like, <laughs> I would Smokey. give up. What are we gonna do? We only brought one engine. 
<laughs> no, we didn't. No, we didn't. <laughs> that truck's got an engine, don't she? Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> but uh, naturally, that wasn't cool with Bill France. Mm-mm. So France decided to make an example of Smokey and set up a 100-person bleacher stand right next to where Smokey would be rebuilding the truck engine. With people watching, there was no way that Smokey could cheat, or so Bill France thought. Smokey had the perfect solution to this. The night before, he stopped at a gas station and bought a little gas and a few handfuls of fireworks. (laughs) He brought the 12-gallon bucket of gasoline with him and set it out in front of the audience. And when the audience started to interfere with his work, he would light the fireworks... (laughs) And throw them into the gasoline and at the audience, effectively scaring away anyone who dared to watch him. Oh, my God. Have you ever had a firework thrown at you? Oh, yeah. I grew up in Kentucky, man. (laughs) (laughs) I like split my childhood between Florida and Kentucky. I've had (laughs) had a a lot of fireworks. I've like shot fireworks like out of my butt. (laughs) I want to know more. (laughs) (laughs) You put like a bottle rocket in your butt crack (laughs) and you light it or you have one of your friends light it and then you shoot it out of your butt. It's hilarious, dude. Yeah. It's so funny. Uh, it's like you think farts are funny. I imagine mean, I if, did. <laughs> imagine if they fly up in the air and explode. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember one time we were at a Fourth of July um, party out in this place called San Miguel, which is mm-hmm. like it's a city, but it feels kind of unincorporated in some areas. You know, mm-hmm. like it's a really small town. Um, and somewhat we we're just chilling, and then like someone threw like a big M80 into the storm drain, Whoa. and then it just like rev- it went off and just reverberated throughout the, the neighborhood. Did you start a wildfire? I didn't. <laughs> did you Did you see the video of those people doing the gender reveal party out in the desert, and they set off fireworks with guns, and then it started like a huge wildfire? Dude, they should be kicked in the butt. Jamie, pull that up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that you should do gender reveals at all. And I think it's well, it's it's like a it's like a baby shower that everyone can come to, you know. Yeah, just have a party. That's it. Smokey successfully rebuilt the shitty tow truck engine and managed to kick everyone's ass with it, proving that he didn't even need to cheat to win. But he did cheat. Yeah, but I mean. You know, I think it's cool of him to prove that he didn't have yeah. to cheat to still win. Mm-hmm. As we'll learn, we'll, we'll learn his motivations for the cheating mm-hmm. a little later. Great. He wasn't all about the cheating. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, things weren't looking up for Hudson Motor Cars. And in 1954, a.k.a. they still kind of sucked. Yeah. Uh, and in 1954, Smokey landed a new job at the head of Chevy's racing team. This was his first big leadership role, and it taught him one very valuable lesson, James. He learned just how important the media was to racers' livelihoods. Media reporters made racers. NASCAR was struggling to gain an audience, as no one was interested in watching a bunch of cars that looked to be straight-off dealer lots race on dirt ovals. In the 1940s and 1950s, only two kinds of racers made the sports page one. All right? Indy 500 winners? And those who died trying to be an Indy 500 winner. People just didn't care about stock car drivers. According to Smokey... The biggest impact on NASCAR fame was press coverage. Smokey talked a lot with the media and really helped NASCAR get off the ground. (laughs) Sports writers weren't interested in reporting on NASCAR as the fan following was too small to make any profit. So, in 1955, GM chief Ed Cole came up with a plan. He asked Smokey to give away 200 brand new Chevys <laughs> to reporters just to convince them to attend the race. And uh, it worked. Reporters flocked to the field so they could hopefully get their hands on a Chevy of their own. And that was when NASCAR truly began to gain popularity. So, like, <laughs> there's, there's like, hey, come to the track. We'll give you a I'll, Chevy. I'll give you a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you come, just watch. And back then, they, they were stock. So yeah. it was like, y- you come watch me drive this car fast, and I'll give you one. Mm-hmm. That's insane to me. Like, imagine now. I mean, NAS- I mean NASCAR now is losing a fair, not a fair amount, but it's losing viewers kind of every year. Mm-hmm. So, it's because they're all dying. Oh, all the fans. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think they should try this again and just give everyone Camaros and Challengers and stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that NASCAR should do. Maybe we could talk about that on another episode. Uh, what I would do, 
What would I do? I would have more Roval tracks. Yeah, people always want to see them turn. Right. Yeah. Like the Charlotte race is like the best one of the season because it's just, one, <coughs> the, the track is really good, and two, it's just bananas. You know? Yeah. I think they need to do more of that. For being one of the biggest figureheads in early NASCAR PR, Smokey had a real hobby of messing with the reporters. He, he loved once it. He loved it. He once told a reporter the only reason he hadn't used a turbine jet engine in a car is because jet fuel is square-shaped, and we aren't able to make square-shaped fuel lines to accommodate it, and all we got are these old round ones. <laughs> <laughs> Reporters at the time had no idea how cars worked, and Smokey would say outlandish things to see what he could get them to print in the paper. And yes, they did print the jet fuel quote. <laughs> Along with giving Chevys away in 1955, Smokey was still the head of Chevy's factory race effort. Unfortunately for Smokey, Chevy spent their entire their entire racing budget <laughs> on giving away those free cars to reporters. So Smokey was left with a one-ton Chevy box truck and told to figure it out. They didn't even have a tow trailer. They had to flat tow their race cars behind <laughs> the box truck. We flat towed our race car to Albuquerque. Yeah. Now imagine doing that every weekend for an entire year. Yeah, on like 1950s roads. Yeah. Oh my god. So the actual Route 66. Yeah. That'd be crazy. <laughs> that's that's insane, dude. With a meager budget, Smokey did what he had to do to win. He cheated. Rule interpretation is the same as law interpretation. All right. How can you be honest when you're racing a fraudulent concept? Even if you're in ninth grade, you know stock car racing is a good-natured lie. Instead of stock cars, what you end up with is a very fat rule book. The story, like, we mm -hmm. like to think of him as, like, a good-natured good old boy mm -hmm. who grew up on with dirt floors and stuff, but he's also a very philosophical guy. Yeah, dude, he's, like, very romantic. Yeah, I love it. I love he's, him. He's a, a a monk, he's a monk philosopher, monk, racer, cowboy. Yeah, he has like so <laughs> many great long quotes, and he you can tell he really has like a philosophy about life, and in his mind, what he's doing, yeah, is like, fine. He's talking about unjust laws in that quote, he's talking <laughs> yeah. about racing. Like that's yeah. so cool. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> NASCAR at the time was filled with corrupt inspectors filling their own personal interests like probably getting bribed like cardinals and yeah yeah like in the three musketeers like the cardinal from three musketeers he's like supposed to be a man of god but really he's an evil man. that's right and these guys he's an evil man looking at race cars uh and other teams were constantly finding new ways to push the limits smokey considered his style of cheating as defensive cheating <laughs> just trying to keep up with other racers who were cheating faster than him all Smokey did was read the rules, and if something wasn't specifically mentioned, he would assume it was fair game. Because the rules were expected to be bent just a little, there were really only a few things Smokey truly considered to be cheating. Uh, he thought big engines, big gas tanks, expensive foreign materials, and blatant expensive aerodynamic rule violations were actually cheating. Uh, the only one Smokey ever really participated in is using the larger gas tanks, um, as he considered the other forms of cheating. Chicken shit coward options to gain an extraordinarily unfair advantage over the competition. He hated teams that cheated unfairly. If you're going to cheat, you got to cheat fair. <laughs> For him, cheating wasn't about winning. It was all about the thrill of the invention. Uh, basically, he loved being clever. Mm -hmm. uh, when it came to fiddling with fuel capacity, Smokey was the master as he had to be, as other teams would find new ways to sneak in extra gas or even pay off tech inspectors to sneak their cars through. Um, All them other teams were cheating 10 times worse, so we did it in self-defense. We gave you a little taste of his gas tank trickery in our last episode, uh, but we'll go over it again. Regulation gas tanks at the time were 22 gallons. Smokey found that if he installed a 26-gallon tank and inflated a basketball inside of it, it would only allow 22 gallons of fuel. Once he was past the tech inspection station, he would deflate the ball and fill it back up to its full capacity. He would also run 11 feet of 2-inch <laughs> fuel lines. Yeah, because there was a... 
So there was a rule about the gas tank being 22 gallons. And Smokey found in the book, he was like, well, they don't say nothing about fuel lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he, he, which is like, that's why he's so brilliant because yeah. he's technically not, not cheating. cheating. Yeah. He's not breaking any rule. There's no rule that says you can't run 11 feet of two inch fuel lines instead of, you yeah, know, not that, 11 feet of quarter inch line. Yeah, that's a fair cheat. Yeah. You know, that's not an unfair one. He's like Robin Hood. You know, like Basically. technically, am I breaking the law? Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> uh, but it's an unjust law. Yeah, it's an unjust law. So like, yeah, I am stealing gold from the sheriff of Nottingham, mm. but I'm giving it to all the kids. Yeah. I'm sucking those jewels off that blind guy's <laughs> Remember that part? Yeah. That movie was weird. <laughs> I had an ex-girlfriend uh, once that the fox, Robin Hood was her first crush. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good looking fox. <laughs> yeah, man, he's foxy. Yeah. Um, um, but but this, this two inch fuel line trick allowed him another six gallons of fuel that's in the crazy, car. crazy, yeah. During one inspection, uh, the inspectors had removed the tank and he was tagged with nine penalties Oof. that needed correction before he could race. Smokey was so fed up with the inspection station at that point that he hopped in the car and shouted, better make that tan, before he drove off using an illegal amount of fuel in his fuel line. That's so awesome. <laughs> Despite his limited budget, Smokey was doing the best he could for Chevy. He pushed the Chevy engines to their breaking point and kept winning race after race for them. Good job, Smokey. But by 1957... He noticed a trend. Every time he would try to get in touch with the GM executives, he would be blown off or ignored. So after a while, he got sick of it and quit, signing an exclusive three-year contract with Ford, which was a much better offer. Smokey got a raise from $12,000 a year to $40,000 a year and was given an expense account and real resources. Hell yeah, that dude. credit card, baby. It's coming up, baby. Give me that pin. Uh, <laughs> little did Smokey know that in 1957, all major U.S. auto manufacturers signed a gentleman's agreement to stop all racing efforts, leaving Smokey unemployed. But Smokey wasn't even that upset. No. No. He, because he had his eyes set on something bigger. Mm. To him, NASCAR management had become a dictatorship with new rules popping up everywhere, many specifically targeted at Smokey. He figured that stock car racing had basically turned into a giant marketing scam, and he was searching for something real. Yeah. None of that fake no, shit. That real. Stuff. That real, real. That real, you know? real, yeah. I've been there. Dude, the other, um, on Sunday, uh -huh. me and my girlfriend went to the dog beach in Long Beach, and mm -hmm. I was like, all right, I'll be back in a second. I just walked into the ocean <laughs> and just stood there as the waves were just like, mm -hmm. and I just looked out at the sea for like five minutes. Didn't even realize it, but I was, I was just like. You're having a real moment. Yeah, it was great. Hearing the dogs barking behind me and the waves. So I get where Smokey's coming from. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, mean, I think Smokey and us are kind of cut from the same cloth. Yeah. You know, we're like bad boys with a real strict moral code. That's right. Yeah, we take down the establishment. <laughs> and I steal. <laughs> <laughs> and I steal and cheat. <laughs> For some reason, it was really important to me to be identified as a real racer. And the only way to do that was to win at Indy. Unless you were an Indy 500 winner, racers in the U.S. at the time were akin to lepers. Wow. That last part, uh, although it sounds dramatic, apparently was true. Race car drivers at the time were considered drunks who caused <laughs> nothing but trouble. Well, today, a driver might find themselves in a fancy hotel or a million-dollar RV after mm. a big race. But in the 50s and 60s, a lot of racers would find themselves in a cell, Ooh. spending the night in the drunk tank instead. Yikes. And when you learn about how NASCAR started, that might not be such a big surprise. Stock car racing began in the U.S. thanks to moonshiners who would modify their cars to evade the police, and then they would mess around with their friends afterwards to see whose cars was the fastest. Since the beginning, alcohol played a huge role in everything racing-related. Racers lived incredibly... Uh, dangerous lives filled with sex, Woo. drugs, Woo. alcohol, Woo. and lots of parties. Hell yeah. NASCAR had a huge liquor problem, and even Smokey had become an Olympic-class <laughs> alcoholic by 1959. These people lived intense lives. Smokey even said, These people would either die young in an accident while racing, or their livers would give up before they reached 50. Jeez. Um, 
so through like drag racing, I've met a lot of like older dudes uh-huh. who have were racing around the same time, and yeah. like that part, <laughs> just to have it confirmed by Smokey mm-hmm. Eunuch is um, pretty interesting because like you know you talk to these guys and they're talking about how racing was every weekend. Mm-hmm. They were just they lived in their trucks and just scrap together any money they can to work on their cars. Like and they had like wild stories. Yeah, they just like always drinking. They it's so much different than it is today. Yeah, today they're like athletes. Yeah. Like they're oh, totally. world class. Especially athletes. indie car guys. Like yeah. those guys are like <laughs> running marathons in between races mm-hmm. and just yeah, like all kinds of electrodes hooked up to them and mm-hmm. run on a treadmill and then yeah. a bunch of scientists in white coats are writing down graphs and charts. <laughs> so to Smokey's point about like NASCAR turning into like a marketing thing, mm-hmm. I think he's 100% right. Yeah. You know? So like Nolan was saying, the general consensus was that stock drivers were a fairly low class <laughs> of people. <laughs> and Smokey wanted to rise above that. So he believed that the only way for him to do that was to compete in Indy. In 1958, Smokey found an old Curtis Indy car for sale in Daytona Peach. He was broke at the time, but managed to scrape together just enough money for the car through sponsorships and plenty of begging. Sounds about right. One such sponsorship was the city of Daytona Beach themselves, where he agreed to name the car the City of Daytona Special. (laughs) But Smokey found himself caught within the twisted gears of bureaucracy when they tried changing the name to the Halifax Recreational Area Special. It doesn't quite have the same Mm -mm. ring. Smokey told the entire city of Daytona to go fuck themselves (laughs) instead. That is, and we do some sponsorship, Mm -hmm. some branded Mm -hmm. content stuff, and uh, that sounds very familiar. that's really, like, just let us... Let Smokey do his thing. Yeah, we promise it'll be better. Yeah. We'll make you guys look good. Just please don't make me mention that your car has Apple CarPlay. <laughs> it's pretty frustrating. <laughs> in 1958, Smokey entered this car in his first Indy 500 race. Things were looking good until about halfway through his first lap. Within the first few minutes of the race, there had been a 25-car pileup, which had managed to knock Smokey's team out. Wow. But that didn't discourage him. Because Smokey didn't get discouraged. No. Smokey was a winner. That's right. Indy was wild. The parties were crazy. Yeah. Sex and alcohol were everywhere. Oh, sounds like my out. Smokey got into a few bar fights, uh, as you do. Though, to be fair, he didn't get involved until someone smacked me in the pecker. <laughs> That's when the fight got serious for him. I'm just sitting around here, drinking my beers, having my sex, and some mofo <laughs> comes up with a twig up his butt and he smacks me right in my ding a linger <laughs> there's a bus called the banana boat which <laughs> would take daily trips to a nearby town for racers to go back and shack up with one of the locals at the bar uh there was one driver who was an ex world war ii bomber pilot like Smokey, who had painted a banana on the side of his door for each banana trip he had gone on <laughs> oh, yeah. uh just like you know when Big, you when yeah. you get a kill in your plane do the same thing. Except you weren't killing a fighter pilot. You were smashing a poon. <laughs> You're killing that sweet, sweet poon with your yep. l- with your love cigar. Oh, God, the womb broom. <laughs> um, anyway, that guy had a lot of bananas on his car, I guess, and uh, Indy was crazy. <laughs> of course, Smokey would have loved the banana boat, except he never had a chance to take a trip as he was so busy with race prep. Mm. Though when he describes the women he saw there, he said, I'd walk over two miles of broken whiskey bottles barefoot just to be able to sniff it. Ugh. Sniff <laughs> it. I just want to sniff bun, bun. All right. By 1960, Smokey was finally on a winning indie team, and it made him reflect on his life. He realized that within his two marriages and having two separate families between them, he was a real flop of a father. Let's just say I'm not going to win dad of the year. <laughs> he, he had spent all of his time chasing women and drinking booze that he had n- neglected his children. In 1960, he decided to go cold turkey and never had another drink for the rest of his life. Good for him. Yeah. Indy gave Smokey the kind of freedom to be a real inventor. In 1962, Smokey tried the first wing over driver race car at Indy. Uh, it didn't work. So, like, you know. Yeah, like a Can Am car. Yeah. But 
Uh, he was one of the first people to introduce aerodynamics into Indy, so that he's got that going for him. Uh, in 1964, which is a hu- it's a huge part of yeah, Indy it's a, now. It's yeah. like the biggest part. Yeah, all the engines are the same. I guess all the arrows the same too. Well, depending on there's two engines, and depending on what engine you have. No, wait, I think is it all the same now? No, there's Chevy and Honda. Yeah, but they might have all the same arrow now. It used yeah. to be at least, depending on the engine you had. You'd have a different era racing setup. is so lame now. It's just like <laughs> club racing. Like it's like, why would I watch India? I can watch Spec Miata. That's, well, that's a fair point. I think I think Indy- part of I think what like racing teams or like the big wigs and racing series don't really understand is like one of the things that fans like is the car. Mm-hmm. It's not just about the driver. It's about the car, and you want to see what crazy car the team has come up with for this season. Yeah. Like, FD is really fun to watch because you got, like, Nissans, and you got V8s, you got, you know, totally, yeah. turbo six-cylinders, so you got supercharged, whatever. There's even four-cylinders in yeah. FD. And, like, people fall in love with the car, and the car becomes, like, a character. Mm-hmm. If you look at, like, historic race cars. Totally. I... I agree a lot. Indy is an interesting case because I think the racing is more fun. The actual racing itself is more fun to watch than Formula One because the cars are so similar. Yeah. But, like, walking around the pits, I'm not like, oh, there's, I don't even know the names of the teams. <laughs> yeah. But, like, there's that car. And it has this, it's different from the other one because it has it. Like, if I was at a Formula One pit, I'd be like, oh, dude, there's the Mercedes. Mm-hmm. It's got the craziest engine, the arrow. They've t- totally nailed it. Over on this end, here's the Red Bull though. It's got cra- it can corner better than the Mercedes. Mm-hmm. Blah blah blah. Like, but then they, like to your to that argument though, it's like the but the spending would just get out of control, you know. But I'm let them like, let them. Yeah, it's a freaking. Who so, cares? Yeah, <laughs> let them spend all the money. All right, then we'll have Mercedes winning for the next ten years. But... Sure, <laughs> someone needs to get more money. All right. That's how the world works, <laughs> Nolan. You need money. I know. All I, right, you I, need money, honey. You can't just get a. You can't get around on those good looks forever, baby boy. Don't I know it? In you, 19- you got yeah, sure. You got that golden personality, those big muscles, and that beautiful face. But you need some freaking money, baby. I, that would be awesome. In 1964, he dreamed up the capsule car. The driver of the capsule car uh, would be sitting in a sidecar attached to the side of the main oh, fuselage. Yeah. This thing is so yeah, sick. Which housed the engine. The design was based off a German BV-141 fighter he had encountered on a mission during World War II. Uh, the design was insane. Uh, I definitely suggest you guys look it up. Google a picture of this thing. The capsule it doesn't car. even look like a it's car. It's really sick. Um it was crazy, and they had a really hard time building it, especially since it was initially designed to have a jet engine in the middle. But that we was going to put a jet motor engine in it, but turns out them's real expensive. Yeah. That would have been insane to see. Uh, in 1964. Can you imagine being at a race and like you look out on the starting line, you're like, what the fuck? Is that? And you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 1964. Smokey was called back to NASCAR. This time, the chief executive of GM requested Smokey's home mechanic expertise in the upcoming Chevelle prototypes. He brought it to a race just to see how it would perform, but it almost didn't happen. The car, the Chevelle, was the first stock car to be fitted with a rubber fuel cell, which was far safer than any of the steel death traps that had been previously used. Normally, they would they'd strap like a... Uh, steel tank Mm -hmm. uh, three inches behind the bumper and fill it with the fuel and that had a tendency to explode if there were any uh, sort of accidents. Uh, NASCAR officials didn't want him to race with his illegally safe fuel tank. (laughs) What? (laughs) But he wasn't going to step foot near a track without it. So he got a pass just this one time and the rubber fuel tank was legalized for track use soon after and now everybody uses those in their race cars. Yeah, yeah. We don't want him to like not die more than anyone. <laughs> you want know, like that? okay? I think like everyone should be like probably gonna die if they wreck. Yeah, everyone should be close to death. Yeah, the Chevelle did not perform very well. Mm. He gave the engineers at GM some advice. 
move the engine down and shift back three inches. But they weren't interested in listening to some freaking hick boy mm -hmm. who didn't even have a high school diploma. So he said, fine, I'll do it. And he took it back to his shop and began to work. At the shop, Smokey had what is called a rotisserie setup mm. where he would suspend the entire car in the air and could rotate it to access any part of the car. It's so it rolls awful. around. They're super cool. Eddie yeah. built one. Rumors started flying that Smokey was working on a bit of a special car. And he was. <gasps> he had taken the 1967 Chevelle provided by Chevy and modified it just a teeny mm. bit for track use. <laughs> the official NASCAR rules at the time stipulated that the frame of the car could be substituted for another manufacturer, and that manufacturer just so happened to be Smokey. <laughs> he lowered the roof and brought the engine back three inches, using the engine itself as a frame cross member to stiffen the chassis. Very smart. He also offset the engine to the left to gain an advantage on the left turns and modified all of the aerodynamics. So sick. The body had been shifted back a couple of inches, and it's also speculated that it modified the frame rails to accommodate another five <laughs> gallons of fuel in hidden auxiliary tanks. That's so sick. The 67 Chevelle was a sight to behold. It was so much faster than the competition during testing that the inspection station immediately started digging into exactly what rules Smokey had broken to make that possible. When he pulled up to the race at tech inspection, the fuel tank was empty. The car was ruled illegal and was banned from the event. With the fuel tank still empty, he started it up and <laughs> drove it all the way back to his shop. Classic Smokey. Rumors began floating around that the car was actually a 7 8 scale of the normal Chevelle, but Smokey would never confirm nor deny this accusation. <laughs> According to Eunuch, the 7 8 Chevelle was the most famous race car that never ran in a race. Do you believe that it was? Yeah. I want to believe. I yeah. want to believe. Yeah. <laughs> the truth is out there. Yeah. <laughs> I also heard that he, so he pulled up with it and he did really well at qualifying or practice or whatever. And they like, were like looking at it and whatever. And they were like, this doesn't look right. And he was like, check it. And so they were like, you know what? We're going to go get another Chevelle from the parking lot and test them against each <laughs> other. And Smokey had built two of them. What? And they went and got that one and parked it next to no him. No way. And they were like, oh, I guess it's the same. That's. I don't know if that's true or that's, not. I, I hope it is. Yeah, that's, I hope it's true. That's just part of the legend of Smokey Unit. In 1968, Smokey also built a Camaro for Trans Am racing. The body of this Camaro was dipped in acid to reduce weight, and he went on to set several speed records with this car at the Bonneville Salt Flats. That's amazing. That's so sick. Smokey never considered cheating at Indy. It was kind of like hollowed ground for him. Mm. For being NASCAR's greatest cheater, his rule breaking at Indy was rather tame and basically non existent. Until about 1975, Indy had very few rules and would allow racing teams to do basically whatever they wanted in the name of innovation. That's how it should be. Yeah. I'm saying. I agree with that. Like, we're not, like, remember that, like, vacuum car? Mm hmm. Like, we're never going to have anything like that again. Like, let it run for one race. If someone wants to spend a million bajillion dollars developing a freaking vacuum car and then it just beats everybody by two minutes, let them do it. Yeah. But then you can make it illegal afterwards. I think, for the most part, that endurance cars, like the prototype or LMP1 cars, mm, yeah. I think those are unrestricted except for a length, height, and width mm -hmm. limit, and then they can do like whatever they else they want. Like they can't be super short? Yeah. I think there's like a certain dimensions they have to hit, but everything else is like That's cool. kosher. What yeah. if someone came out with just like a super fast, really tall car? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I don't... I don't know, man. <laughs> Things like eight feet tall. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> Spanking our little butts. <laughs> That'd be sick. But after new rules started to pop up, Smokey got bored and left the racing scene completely in 1975. So once they started making it standardized, like what you were talking about, he's like, you know what? This ain't fun no more, yeah. fellas. This is boring. Yeah. What Smokey Eunuch really prided himself with at the end of the day was his ability to invent. That's mm -hmm. why he loved cheating so much. He loved the thrill of inventing clever ways of breaking the rules, but he didn't just invent cheats. Mm -mm. He invented everything from a 180-degree flat plane twin-turbo V8 engine to the Holley four-barrel double pumper carb. 
He even mastered reversing the rotation of engines so that the centrifugal forces could be better utilized to help stock cars turn left. But one of his greatest inventions was the flow bench. Mm -hmm. He was the first to develop a machine that could adequately test airflow in cylinder heads, which completely revolutionized the way performance parts were manufactured. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like one of the first things that you... That's like an easy way of making more Mopello, baby. Mopello, like baby. Testing, flow, you know, flow benching your heads mm -hmm. and then um, machining them. Yeah. <laughs> basically. He invented that. He's like so tough and so like scrappy mm -hmm. and so like sharp, but he's a f genius. But all, yeah, super smart. And I don't know, I think that really comes from his super rough upbringing where it's like he just had to figure a lot of stuff out on his own and. Yeah, it's like because of time. and in spite of his super yeah. upbringing. Like race car drivers now, again, are just like nerds who are best friends with their dad. <laughs> and Smokey Eunuch was like a bomber pilot, womanizer, which isn't like that cool, but like it's cool. <laughs> uh, we all can agree that having sex with people is cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Cool guys, you know, wait till you're ready if you're listening to this. But again... Don't listen to this because this one is not safe for children. Yeah, <laughs> this is unsafe for people under the age of eighteen. <laughs> but he's also like a mad scientist. Yeah, he's. I wish I was smoking you. Like before we, before we started the series, like I I heard his name and heard kind of the legend stuff, but that's all you kind of hear is like the cheating stories. But mm -hmm. when you really like hear the background and the the origins, that's mm -hmm. when that's where it really turns into admiration for me. Right, you know. So he came from a rough background. How did he pay for all this? Well, back in the 50s, Smokey was invited down to Ecuador to join Mickey Thompson's gold mining operation. We got to do an episode of Mickey Thompson, yeah, too. Yeah, he's cool, too. Great. Yeah, great story. As it turned out, gold wasn't really popping. So in 1961, Smokey turned to something he was oddly good at, oil prospecting and drilling. Mm. In no time, Smokey had turned a $100,000 investment into tens of of millions of dollars, finding multiple oil veins and working as a machinery consultant for other adjacent oil and gold mines. That's so cool. That's so cool. He's a multi-millionaire, <laughs> just like bottle rocket. Yeah. <laughs> with no pubes. <laughs> he worked part-time in Ecuador for 33 years with his wife, Margie. How do you work part-time? In like, Ecuador? <laughs> Yeah, it's noon. I'm gonna go back to America. <laughs> I just think he like didn't live there full time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he'd go for six to months to a yeah, year. Yeah. It's 33 years. You know, p part time of 33 years can still be a long time. 28 years. Yeah. <laughs> he lived there with his wife Margie, the same person who yeah. transcribed his book. Yeah, remember that. Yeah, he's still talking to his wife about the banana boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, man, I wish I went on a banana boat. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. He never got bored of Ecuador. Every day I learned something new, whether it was about culture or just the easiest way to get something done. Oh, man. In one amazing quote, he said, I learned from the Indians. Anything you don't understand, eat it. Piss on it. F it or kill it. But never leave any major life decisions unsettled. That's an Eddie's philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you don't understand, eat it, piss on it, <laughs> f it, or kill it. Eddie's like nodding his head, like, yeah, I like this guy. Yeah, dude. <laughs> That's an insane philosophy, but also, like, it's <laughs> piss pretty... on it. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand jellyfish. <laughs> At one point in his life after racing, he was approached by Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and he was asked to serve on the board of directors. So this high school dropout was given the chance to serve on one of the most prestigious aeronautical universities in the country. That's amazing. And he was made a founding member and even received an honorary PhD in aeronautical engineering from the college. Promoting him now. To millionaire Dr. <laughs> Smokey Unit. The world is not ready. Dr. This f***ing guy I know. is the coolest guy who's ever lived. Yeah. Name someone cooler. I want to say Carol Shelby, but I don't think I, I don't can. think he is. No. I don't think he is. That's crazy. How do we find someone Carol cooler Carol Shelby, Shelby only effed one lady. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Smokey Eunuch effed hundreds. Carol Shelby was a pilot. Smokey Eunuch was a pilot. Yeah. Uh, Smokey Eunuch was a race car driver. Uh, Carol Shelby had to quit race car. And Carol Shelby, by the way, is my favorite guy. Yeah. He was. Yeah. <laughs> but he had to quit because he had a heart condition. I think Smokey, Smokey quit because he thought it got boring. Yeah. That's insane. I think Smokey. Yeah. He's taking the crown, man. Yeah. Oil Baron. Doctor. <laughs> What's going on over there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making dinosaur noises in my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> oh, man. Doctor. Whoa. Yeah. Do uh, <laughs> Gold Prospector. Just insane. Sp yeah, he's like the most interesting guy who's ever lived. Smokey's life after racing was filled with one incredible invention after another. He began self-educating and spent his time researching alternative fuel substitutes. He's even, Iron Man! Yeah, even once designing an engine that could run off of animal fat. I went from being a pussy hound to a petrochemist. <laughs> <laughs> he developed a lead-acid electric car he thought would change the world. Despite him being an oil tycoon at this point, Smokey was always afraid of what would happen when the oil finally ran out. And guess what, guys? It's still going to run out. Uh, one invention he never gave up on was the development of hydrogen-powered cars. But he couldn't get past the issue of storage, uh, which still plagues hydrogen cars today. A 2,000-pound storage system has about the same energy as 20 gallons of gas, and he could not develop an economical way to introduce hydrogen into modern cars. Possibly his most amazing invention was the hot vapor engine, an <laughs> engine that would utilize, even when he's doing science, he's sexy. Yep. Hot vapor engine. Oh. <laughs> an engine that would utilize excess heat in three stages to increase efficiency of the engine's reactions. Using this incredible technology, he had developed a one-cylinder engine that could produce nearly 180 horsepower. That's insane. The design was sold to John DeLorean, but the entire project was killed when the entire GM motor tech program went under in 1987, killing mm. all hopes of hyper-efficient single-cylinder engines mm. for decades to come. Hmm. Why would they want to suppress technology that could revolutionize? I don't know. Transport like I that. I don't know, Nolan. Hmm. The fall of the motor tech program put Smokey's shop in a bit of a financial bind, forcing him to close his doors that same year. He has millions of dollars. Yeah, I thought he was a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, he's probably just like, eh, I'm done with yeah. this. Yeah, he's just retiring. Yeah. Smokey retired that same year. Smokey closed the doors to his shop that same year and took an early retirement. Mm -hmm. Though to his credit, his hot vapor engine and his cowboy hat are still on display at the Smithsonian That's today. That's awesome. Outside of researching alternative fuel sources, Smokey was also a prolific writer. He wrote monthly in Popular Science and became the Dear Abby of Cars with his article, Say Smokey. <laughs> he wrote for the magazine for over 28 years. He also wrote for Circle Track magazine for another 11. So not only... Hold on. Yeah, he was a great... Wait a minute. Wait, he's a great writer, <laughs> but he's like, I minute. don't feel like writing my autobiography. <laughs> Maybe he just thought it was like a fun thing we could do together. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, baby, grab your typewriter. <laughs> I, I was, yeah. hey, you know what? I'm all, I'm spending all this time inventing things and, you know, writing these articles for these magazines. I thought maybe you and I could do something fun together. Maybe work on a little project, you and me. Yeah, what what you great. think about that? Sounds great. All right, how about you grab your typewriter? Let's write a what? book about all the ladies I fucked. Oh, I don't want to do this yeah, anymore. Yeah, let's write a, just a long 600-page book about... All the cool stuff I did and all the ladies I <laughs> uh, That's exactly how it is. <laughs> wow. Um, in 1995, Smokey completely lost hearing in both of his ears. And after 10 surgeries at ten the- 10 surgeries? Yeah, 10. Five on each ear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after 10 surgeries at Mayo Clinic's Jacksonville campus- um, his hearing was partially restored. When it come when it came to hearing damage, he said, "Racers take this seriously. You must be protective of your hearing. Racers are very susceptible to this. So are the fans. Muffle your race cars to about ninety to ninety five <laughs> decibels. Hearing damage is like smoking. The damage is cumulative, but it will absolutely appear in time and damage your life in a negative way." You know what? I'm gonna hop on with Smokey Unic here and also recommend that. We all wear earplugs yeah. at racing events. I think you should. Yeah. Especially if you got kids. Get them those cute little... Oh, dude. There's nothing cooler than like a baby with earmuffs on. I know. Like at a monster truck yeah, event? Yeah. I love that. Love it. 
On January 13th, 2001, Smoky Eunuch was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and was given a projected life expectancy of three months. He ended his book with these few passages. If you don't get anything out of this book, make your number one priority your health. For you, it ain't going to happen to me, dreamers. You'll feel very helpless when you find the big C has just poked its fangs into your ass. He finished his book on February 20th, 2001, and died on May 3rd, 2001, two months, at, two months later than expected, leaving behind a lasting legacy of rule-bending insanity. If you want to be like Smokey Eunuch, there is a Smokey Eunuch engineering course at the University of Central Florida. I want to be like Smokey Eunuch. Yeah. I quit. <laughs> I'm going to Florida. Where you can actually earn a PhD in race car engineering. I wish I knew about that when I was... I'm glad you didn't know about that, man. You wouldn't be here. <laughs> That's true. Hmm. Uh, or if you'd rather not get a PhD today, find yourself a copy of Smokey Eunuch's Garage Take some time to learn about the intensity and struggles, and I guess all the sex. All the sex. That went into building this legend. Smokey Eunuch, rest in peace, man. Rest in peace. This word gets thrown around too much, but legend. Definitely a legend. Absolute Certified legend. Certified legend. New bit on the show, maybe? Certified legend? Certified legend. I'm coining it now. Certified legend. First, stamp it. First official certified legend. The past gas legend stamp. Yep. Coolest guy ever. Yeah. This guy is now my favorite guy. Definitely. How often do you get a new favorite guy? <laughs> Carol Shelby became my new favorite guy like three years ago. He's now number two. It was Shelby for me for a while. Now it's, it is Smokey Eunuch. Yeah. The coolest guy. We're going to end it here. Um, thank you so much for listening once again. Uh, I still read all your messages. I don't get a chance to reply to all of them, but thank you guys so much this for listening. Is, this is really the most fun thing that we do. Yeah. It's really fun. We do. We get to come here and hang out in the studio and talk to each other for a long time. Then we go eat chicken wings. It's kind of a tradition. <laughs> Very fun. Um, make sure you guys, apparently we're getting a lot of uh, reviews and comments, and apparently that's like a very good thing. Yeah, keep doing that. Uh, so keep doing that. Um, we really appreciate all the kind words. Uh, make sure to tune in next week for part one of Fordlandia. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently, you know, Henry Ford is a freaking weirdo. We'll get into that. And uh, he bought a rubber farm in Ecuador. He, he tried to start a rubber plantation in Brazil, <laughs> and it went bad so it was like a representation yeah. like uh um like perfect society yeah like right? utopia yeah you wanted to build a utopia and it's it's a nutty story so definitely tune in next week for that um yeah just thank you so much for listening follow james on instagram and twitter at uh james pumphrey and Fo follow nolan Ooh. on instagram and twitter at nolan j sykes yes, follow please. donut on everything at donut media if you don't already know we have a youtube channel we make a bunch of videos yep. every week. You'll probably like those if you like these. All right. If you like our podcast, you like our videos. I love you. Be nice. See you next time. You're looking buff. Did you get a new t-shirt? I got a t-shirt. Target. Nice. Nice. Six dollars. Mm-hmm. Pass Gas is supported by listeners like you. Support the sponsors that support the podcast. Great. <laughs>